Good afternoon to the members of the New York Medical College family and welcome to our town hall meeting for the fall semester. The theme for today's meeting is what's new. Our team members are gonna tell you what is new in relationship to our new partnership with the Lovelace Biomedical Research Institute of Albuquerque, New Mexico. They're gonna tell you what's new with clinical chair recruitments, what's new with biomedical science faculty recruits, what's new with our buildings and grounds and construction, what's new in the School of Health Sciences and Practice, what's new in relation to what our new medical and dental school classes look like, what's new in relationship to campus management of the pandemic, and you're gonna meet two new members of the team, Jennifer Salcedo and Regina Williams. If you've been reading all of our campus newsletters and in touch, you will have read about all of these initiatives, but I thought it was a good idea for you to hear all about what's new face to face. Our COVID vaccination rates have been excellent on our campus, but as we all recognize, while high vaccination rates and our vigorous campus social distancing, masking, and screening saliva testing have kept us out of hospitals and ICUs, they have not kept many of us, including me, from having sore throats, fever, and fatigue from outpatient COVID-19 infections. In face, however, of a worldwide pandemic, I think we can all be grateful for how relatively well the campus community has fared. Really never in human history has a new infectious disease been identified, and with such speed, a new vaccine developed and put into clinical use with such rapidity and success. Our campus has benefited from the heroic work of Drs. Omar, Amler, Contreras, Montecalvo, Solomon, and Ms. Bordenaro, among many others. They've all helped keep us safe, and I'm sure we're all very grateful. Since our last town hall, it's been a continued period of political and social turmoil in the United States and abroad. I'm often contacted by members of the campus community with requests that I issue a public statement on some topic in the news, or I'm criticized because I didn't issue a public statement on some topic in the news. It has and it remains my opinion that as private citizens, each of us is entitled to our opinions on the issues of the day. In my capacity as an officer of the college, however, I ought only be issuing statements on matters which clearly do or might affect the campus community. In that context, I wanna reiterate things I've already said publicly on two topics, but that are on my mind. First, the US Supreme Court has recently issued a ruling which overturn longstanding judicial precedent on women's reproductive health. Like you, I can read, and I know what the Supreme Court did. Now here's what we're gonna do. Our curricula will remain unchanged. We will continue to teach our students and our trainees about the full range of options for women's reproductive health. We will continue to respect the dignity and agency of every patient to make informed decisions about the health care they elect to receive for themselves. Second, disgraceful acts of discrimination, sometimes accompanied by violence, continue to besmirch the American experience. A few months ago, the college archivist, Mr. Nicholas Webb, discovered a 1925 fundraising solicitation from New York Medical College. The solicitation asked for donations so that our college can, quote, select our student body without prejudice to race, creed, or color 
so that each one admitted will reflect credit upon our profession, close quote. That's a pretty extraordinary thing to have said in 1925, and we should all be very proud of that. And this college has been and remains a bastion against bigotry in health science education. Everyone is welcome here. And as we say back home in North Carolina, y'all means everyone. Race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, primary language spoken at hall at home. If you're interested in the generation conservation and dissemination of knowledge about the causes, prevention and treatment of human and animal disease and disability, then everyone is welcome here. The long arc of human history bends towards justice. Sometimes the slope of that arc's angle is longer than we would wish. But as the Old Testament instructs us, justice, justice, ye shall pursue, and we shall. If you have a question for our speakers today, please go ahead and type it into the question box on your computer, and we'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A part of our program. Thanks for joining us, and let's get started with our town hall meeting. Hello, my name is uh, Salomon Amar. I'm the Vice President for Research at New York Medical College and the Senior Vice President of uh, Biomedical Research at Turo University. I'm pleased to provide you with an update on a new affiliate that has joined the Turo University family and New York Medical College as a sister affiliation, Lovelace Biomedical Research Institute. Lovelace Biomedical Research Institute is a facility located in Albuquerque, New Mexico with 500,000 square feet that you can see on this screen, specifically devoted on biomedical research. Um, it's a, an institution that is 75 year old, uh, created by William Randolph Lovelace number one in 1902 that had has a, an a, a illustrated itself over the years at numerous occasions. Uh, President Roosevelt presented the Robert Collier Trophy in 1940 for the implementation of the BLB oxygen mask. Um, this institution has had a long history of biomedical uh, research over the years. Um, I know but up until recently when uh, 19, 1990, Jacqueline Lovelace, the daughter of uh, uh, Randy and Mary Lovelace, uh, was appointed the chairman of the board of director and uh, 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 headed by uh, Robert Rubin that has presented to this group at numerous occasions. The institution is now uh, well-funded, moving into the next uh, uh, century for uh, developing state-of-the-art, up-to-date research in the area of pulmonary function, pulmonary disease, infectious disease, as well as diabetes and chronic disease. There's an interesting um, institution that they have um, created at Lovelace Biomedical Research Institute is the Institute for Imaging, MRI, that is uh, devoted into the determining and developing strategy by uh, uh, preventing essentially traumatic brain injury with subtraction MRI. The present, this is an innovative company addressing challenging national problem. They uh, developed, they developed themselves into a major institution at the time of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We've developed also a strong collaboration even before the affiliation. It explore, it's exploring essentially lung biology and respiratory disease, discovering new therapy, uh, prevention, optimizing research to provide quality service, investigating environmental toxicology, as well as a high quality clinical trial performance. Uh, it has about 811 employees with 250 uh, clients. The, uh, the budget 
of that institution was uh, $80 million in 2021 on, in revenue. As we said, uh, it has 500 square feet, 500,000 square feet, sorry, uh, of facility and about 29 to 30,000 person space uh, network for clinical research population base. One of the characteristics of this uh, LBRI facility is one of the largest private nonprofit research organization in the nation, conducting basic and applied research and testing. LBRI applies a range of research and scientific capabilities to the to government, industry, health organization to find innovative solution to research challenge. Uh, I don't know any. Uh, biotech or industry that is ready to go to the FDA that has not made a stop at Lovelace Biomedical Research Institute for their preclinical testing. Lovelace worked with NIH, DOD, BARDA, FDA, and industry along many other in uh, universities. It's focused essentially into translational research that produced direct improvement to public health. What is unique uh, in Two Lovelace and has capabilities and uh, in, in its capabilities and facility it has a very large BL3 facility. So they have emerged as a major testing for COVID-19. Uh, COVID it has a large and a small animal testing and housing facility in research MRI, MAG, as well as mobile MRI facility with machine learning and neuroscience professionals. It has a unique aerosol science, which is now being implemented for developing the next generation of vaccine, and especially in COVID-19 with inhalation facility. Uh, you will see a new paper that the uh, New York Medical College scientists and Lovelace have collaborated in regard to aerosol and inhalation for COVID-19. It's, it has a large clinical cohort in brain disease, COPD, smoking, and diabetes. The state-of-the-art GLP infrastructure for drug development, extremely attractive for uh, biotech companies coming to develop their product, and over 100 animal models, as I said, for human disease. We plan on leveraging with the uh, creation of a clinical trial unit, as you know, in, in uh, Skyline, we plan to leverage their LBRI clinical trial infrastructure using uh, them as an administrative uh, unit to being able to act as a CRO for running and administering the clinical trials that are going to be administered uh, in, in Skyline. This will coordinate and uh, standardize the operation to make it more efficient uh, for developing important research and uh, 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 making sure consistency for consistency, efficiency, and regulatory compliance. As you know, the regulatory compliance for clinical research is uh, ever increasing. What are the, uh, the programs that we have between New York Medical College already in place? It's a joint Lovelace New York Medical Co uh, College fellow. It, it, it emerged from the fact that Lovelace has always had a need for technical expertise in number, in a number of areas. It needs MD advisors for the clinical trial research, as well as basic science support. And accordingly, already in 21 and 22, before the affiliation, three faculty at New York Medical College were named as Lovelace Fellows for their expertise and they have provided significant uh, basic uh, science as well as clinical support. The, the role of those uh, fellows is to provide advice and support for individual research projects at Lovelace and for joint projects between the two ent entities. But most importantly is to plant the seed for large projects where fellows collaborate with Lovelace scientists to develop new research grants and contract. The 22-23 fellows are about to be appointed and you'll hear more about that. There's a joint funding, seed funding between the two institutions that's been in place. You may have seen, I'm sure that you have seen, if you haven't seen the uh, 
the call for application, please uh, let me know. Both institutions provide funding for seed internal, uh, uh, internal grants that will promote research collaboration between the two institutions. The emphasis is placed on projects that have a strong potential to turn into external funding application. And the program has started last August and is now accepting application for funding uh, in January 2023. Uh, so the future is extremely bright. Uh, I'm extremely proud of uh, bringing this to you and to uh, your information for you to engage Lovelace Biomedical. They will engage you in exchange. Uh, it, it's extremely gratifying to see that an institution like that is joining and being affiliated to the Turo University and mostly with New York Medical College where New York Medical College would leverage on that institution, on the human resource expertise that they have, as well as in the uh, equipment that uh, Lovelace Research Institute has currently. Thank you very much. If anyone needs any more information, please do not hesitate to call me or email me. Thank you again and have a wonderful day. Hello, this is Rob Amler. My topic today is directed to clinicians in our midst, especially those who care for infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. Let's say you have a patient with unusual symptoms that seem to be some kind of syndrome or complex. After you run through the usual etiologies, you find nothing that stands out. So you begin to suspect something in the patient's environment, either at home, in school, on an athletic field, or whatever. So now you can call the referral service based in the pediatric pulmonary division at Boston Children's Health Physicians. We now have a pediatric environmental medicine service that can conduct telehealth visits preferably with the patient in their own home. And we'll do a very thorough environmental workup that includes looking at their bedroom, their basement, furnaces, HVAC, backyard exposures, even lead in the cooking ware. We also will connect when needed with the local health department, the building department, and other government sources of information to get to the bottom of the problem. And let's face it, this is a lot more work than an office-based clinician typically has time to track all those details down. This environmental medicine service will gladly do it for you. You can contact the service in pediatric pulmonary at 593-8800. Dr. Krishnan, Dr. Amy Brown, Dr. Amy Ansell, and yours truly will be glad to help you out. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Marina Holtz. I am the Dean of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, I'm Interim Chair of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and Professor of Cell Biology and Anatomy. Um, there are excellent things happening here at New York Medical College. As you know, uh, the Graduate School recently became the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. And the other exciting thing is that we welcome four new faculty over the summer. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce them. As you know, I spoke about their arrival at the last town hall, but now they're here. And um, I'm really excited to introduce them to you in no particular order. And I really hope that you'll get to know them and forge new collaborations in research, teaching, and um, in, uh, include them in, the, in our community. Um, so first uh, faculty member I would like to tell you about is Dr. Shui Gao. 
Um, he is studying drug resistance in prostate cancer. And his research program is really exciting. He was uh, recently awarded an award from the Department of Defense, um, which is um, given to new investigators. It's an idea development award. And um, what he's focusing on is prostate cancer, which, uh, although treatable, um, often uh, develops drug resistance. And for those patients who develop drug resistance, um, there's poor clinical outcome. Um, and what he's focusing on is uh, what tumor cells do to um, avoid uh, being killed by the chemotherapy treatment, uh, which is uh, they change their identity, they uh, escape the um, immune therapies, and um, they become more invasive. Um, Dr. Gao focuses on the molecular events inside the cells, specifically inside the nuclear, um, to really figure out how cancer cells uh, change and adapt their gene expression programs in response to drug treatment. So to show you briefly what he's planning to do here in his first few years here at New York Medical College, um, he's focusing on chromatin biology, um, especially on transcription factors, histone modifiers, and DNA modifiers to really find uh, out what is happening at the chromatin level, what is the molecular composition of dif different complexes, how do transcription factors talk to epigenetic modifiers, and how to really target this crosstalk. And as you can see, his work is uh, very translational. Um, he focuses on cell lines, uh, model organisms, as well as patients, um, and hoping to translate his uh, discoveries into clinical approaches in the clinic. Um, so again, he's uh, really awesome, really collaborative. I already spoke to him several times about his research, and I've seen him in the classroom. So make sure you say hello to Dr. Shui Gao. Um, the next faculty member is um, Dr. Malik Bessirier. Um, he has a joint appointment in cell biology uh, and anatomy, as well as in physiology. And he's also an outstanding young investigator and was recently awarded a K01 grant from the NIH, um, which is um, a, a mentor research award. His area is uh, molecular proteogenesis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So PH is a rare disease, uh, but um, it doesn't have uh, very good uh, treatment strategies um, and the survival prognosis is uh, really bleak here. Um, so the exact cause is unknown and there is no cure, um, but the Bisseria lab is up and running uh, to study the molecular mechanisms um, of uh, PAH. Um, and as you can see, he is targeting this disease from multiple molecular and cellular approaches. And just to tell you a little bit more about his exact um, research program, um, he's focusing very similar to Dr. Gao on the transcriptional and epigenetic alterations. So hopefully there is uh, some synergy between these two labs um, to identify disease vulnerability, um, predisposing factors, um, and also very translational to develop personalized therapies uh, such as gene therapy. Therapy. So again, um, this work um, goes from patients um, to the bench and back to the clinic. Um, and I hope that you'll be able to say hello to Dr. B. Sirier and talk about potential collaborations. Um, our third faculty member who's joining us is Dr. Jian Li. Um, he is appointed in the Department of Cell Biology and Anatomy. Um, he is also a recipient of a major award from the NIH, Maximizing Investigators Research Award, or MIRA grant, um, which, uh, as you know, is one of the recent mechanisms by NIGMS to support investigators. Um, his work is uh, really interesting, focusing on proteostasis, um, which is a cellular mechanism that is responsible for many uh, diseases, disorders, um, including aging. Um, so he's focusing on uh, protein folding and the role of a specific factor called HSF1 um, in its activity uh, in aging and coordinating the processes of protein folding um, from native conformation to misfolded to aggregated protein. Um, and as you can see, there are several aspects of this. One of them is female reproductive aging and all cell biology. Um, and just to give you a few slides about uh, what he's planning to do here in his next few years here at New York Medical College um, is to um, study how HSF1 promotes normal cancer proliferation um, and contributes to mitochondrial biogenesis, and he's using multi-omics approach 
approaches um, to look at proteomics, metabolomics, um, single cell sequencing um, to really tackle this very interesting question. Um, and uh, again, uh, Dr. Jian Li is very collaborative and super friendly, and I welcome you to come talk to him. And last but not least um, is uh, Dr. Julie DiMartino. Um, she is appointed in the Department of Cell Biology and Anatomy. She is also a grant recipient. Um, her work focuses on uh, studying metastasis and um, dissemination, specifically in breast cancer. And for that work, she received an award from the MetaViver Foundation, which is an early career award. I apologize for the type on the slide, that's mine. Um, and um, as you know, the uh, problem with breast cancer is that it is a metastatic disease and it is the metastasis that kills the patient. So understanding how cancers uh, metastasize, um, how they evolve from being a non-aggressive, non-invasive cancer uh, from dormancy to metastasis and reactivation is very important. Um, and she is studying those mechanisms in great detail. Um, her specialty is imaging. Um, so in, the, in addition to understanding the mechanisms of dormancy and transition to metastasis, um, she uh, uses uh, very high-end, um, elegant uh, microscopy-based approaches. Um, and you can also see that this, uh, uh, these techniques are very, very translational, and they range from preclinical approaches to um, studies in animals and other model organisms, um, such as OVA, as well as studying uh, metastasis in patients. Um, and this work will contribute to our understanding of breast cancer metastasis and hopefully how to prevent it. Um, so again, um, give a virtual round of applause to these four outstanding faculty members. We're exceptionally excited to welcome them here, um, and I hope that they will be productive in all of their research endeavors. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Ron Matten. I'm the AVP for Facilities and Capital Planning here at New York Medical College, and welcome to the 2022-23 Capital Construction Projects presentation. I've divided our presentation into major construction projects where we are employing a construction manager to supervise trades and minor construction projects where the facility staff is, is managing the trades. Our major projects are divided into the DSB laboratories and associated spaces, the energy performance contract, the Kotakoff Learning Center, phase two of disaster medicine, and the clinical skills expansion. Not counting the energy contract, this represents nearly 45,000 square feet of construction work. The basic science building was built in 1972 to accommodate New York Medical College move from Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital to our current Valhalla campus. The building was last refreshed in 2001 when the Medical Education Center was built. We are renovating 35,050 square feet of laboratory space and associated spaces which represents about 20% of the building. Some progress photos demonstrate where we are in the project. The carpenters have been in and are framing out the petition wall, and the electricians are completely rewiring the laboratories to accommodate the new equipment. The plumbers are in now, and here they are trenching some drains for the new drain lines. And you can see the carpenters have closed up the walls. I'm expecting the laboratory casework to start arriving in mid-October, and I'm expecting to start turning over labs by the end of the calendar year. Another major project has been the energy performance contract. Within the energy performance contract, we have the interior and exterior lighting controls, computerized energy controls, sealing up the drafts within the building envelope, replacements of toilets and sink for domestic water savings, uh, adding a summer boiler to Seven Dana Road, the heat recovery system, which will allow the latent heat from the exhausting air to heat the incoming air, retro commissioning, laboratory configurations, reconfiguring the transformers to allow for a, additional um, power saving and mechanical insulation. We are estimated to save about $800,000 in utility savings, including uh, giving us a better carbon footprint. At 19 Skyline, we're beginning rebuilding the Konikoff Learning Center, which will be situated on the fourth floor in room 465. The center will allow 90 students to learn 
as large groups can either learn together or break into smaller groups. The construction manager is on board and the kickoff meeting will happen shortly. Phase two of disaster medicine will add 1,600 square feet to the disaster medicine suite. The plans are being revised as we look into gain greater efficiency in this next step of building. The clinical skills expansion will add 10,000 square feet to the clinical skills program. Uh, we have currently completed the architecturals and the, and the mechanical drawings, and now we're working with a professional cost estimator to see how much money we need to raise. Facility is also managing some smaller, but no less important projects. We will expand, we have expanded SHSP 111 and 112 into a single learning space to accommodate a larger class audience. We will be paving the front drive of 19 Skyline, which is this picture that you see now. Work is expected to start at the end of October and will need your cooperation with parking during the paving process. The air conditioning is being replaced at the south side of the ground floor of 19 Skyline. Our engineer is currently designing the specifications to meet the needs. And in October, we will begin working on the foundation waterproofing at Sunshine Cottage. This phase will begin with the northeast area of the building, and it will involve excavating the complete foundation and applying a waterproof coating. I thank you for your time today, and that's the end of our presentation. Good afternoon. I'm Marissa Montecalvo. I'm the medical director of New York Medical College Health Services. And I just want to give you a brief update on COVID, flu, and a few words about monkeypox. So our website is listed here at the bottom. Everything that I'm presenting is available on our website. And I hope you'll take the time to take a look and use that as a resource as well. So starting with SARS-CoV-2, there is a new booster available. It's the bivalent booster, which has the ancestral strain plus targeted for Omicron. And on August 31st, the FDA approved this for use for all people who have be received primary vaccination, irrespective of uh, how many boosters you've received previously. Anyone 12 years of age and older is to receive a bivalent booster this year uh, in preparation for winter, at least two months after your last dose. So again, this booster is strongly advised for everyone who has completed primary vaccination two months later. It is the only booster available. You can't receive the prior vaccine as a booster any longer. The prior vaccine is being used for primary vaccination. This bivalent vaccine cannot be used for that purpose. I wanna say a few words about face masks. Um, we modified the face mask policy. Our university has over 99% of people here are vaccinated and received a booster last winter spring. So that combined with rates going down, we were able to modify the policy. Face masks are required anywhere healthcare is delivered, which is the third floor of the Skyline building here in health services. And we also require it in simulated patient care settings and also in the anatomy lab. In accordance with New York State regs, you are to wear a face mask for 10 days after you've been diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2, so even for the period when you're off isolation and after exposure, and certainly if you suspect that you may have it. And anyone who is exempt from vaccination is to wear a face mask. Recommendations are, you know, really common sense things. You know, if you're in a crowded area, if you're in a lecture hall, obviously if you're immunosuppressed, we would hope we would recommend that you continue to wear face masks. They really do work and they're an important barrier to infection. So the essentials for SARS-CoV-2 for this year are get that bivalent booster. Please do not come in if you don't feel well. Please call us. We will work with your supervisor or with your academic supervisor for excused absences. And if you're positive, please let us know. We will let you know exactly what needs to be done. And again, all of this is on our website. 
few words about flu. Flu is still important. Please don't forget about flu. We want everyone to get a flu shot and we offer it at no charge for students. We have the quadrivalent vaccine. We'll be offering flu clinics over in the basic science building. And we're looking forward to working jointly with the Family Health Center who has the bivalent vaccine. So um, to have uh, clinics where both the bivalent vaccine and the flu vaccine can be offered, there's no contraindication to receiving both on the same day. And lastly, just a few words about monkeypox. I know you've heard about this. This is a viral illness, uh, which besides the rash can really make you sick with fever, chills, swollen lymph nodes. It is predominantly spread by close skin to skin contact with um, and contact with the rash or with body fluids of someone who has this infection. Uh, currently, it is an outbreak that is occurring predominantly in the community of men who have sex with men, but not solely. And uh, if you think that you're at risk, uh, there are quite a few resources available. There is a vaccine readily available at the County Department of Health, as well as at the medical center. And there's also antiviral treatment. We have an area on our website about this. I hope you'll take the opportunity to take a look. So in closing, I just wanna say that we're, it's great to have um, everybody back and everyone in health services wants to wish you a very safe and healthy year. Thanks very much. I look forward to your questions. Hello, my name is Karen Murray and I'm the Associate Dean of Admissions for the School of Medicine here at New York Medical College. Today, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of our previous cycle or 2021, 2022 cycle, which was a virtual cycle for the admissions. We had approximately 12,000 applicants, which was a slight decrease from our previous cycle, which was our all-time high of over 15,000 applicants. Of our 12,000 applicants, we invited about 1,200 for interview, and we had approximately 1,000 who interviewed with us. The interview cycle is from September through March, and it ends with the start of the M1 classes, July 25th of 2022. Our virtual MMI platform is what we use for this past cycle, and it's what we're gonna be using for the current cycle that just started. Um, we will continue to have our two circuits with um, nine applicants per circuit. The day starts with the morning orientation. During orientation, the applicants get to hear from Dr. Halperin, Dr. Nadler, and Dr. Etienne. They also have a student panel, which happens around midday. And then slightly after midday start and probably around one o'clock or so, they start their interview sessions with the MMI interviewers. The portal that we're using is the, is the Profit HR portal. It's a wonderful portal for the virtual MMI and that once the portal, once the session starts, the portal really runs itself. So the applicant and the interviewer really just have to sit and speak with each other. Our virtual, um, for the virtual portal, the MMI interviewers have multiple training sessions. They have group training sessions. They have individual training sessions. They had some mock MMIs to get them used to the portal, as well as to help them kind of work through any issues they may have. We do have uh, daily briefing sessions for the um, interviewers. And at these briefing sessions, we can talk about any updates to the portal as well. Once the applicants have finished their interviews, um, their application packets and their interview packets is put together and it's given to the admissions committee members. Our admissions committee had 25 members last year and we met twice a month over Zoom to discuss the applicants and, and, this, and, and make a decision uh, as to whether to accept an applicant into our school. All accepted applicants were offered an on-campus tour. We had groups of 10 to 12. The applicants needed to be fully vaccinated to be on campus. They also had to comply with our on-campus survey. And this was going really well. It started, um, the day starts about 11.30. They met with Dr. Nadler, who's the Dean of the School of Medicine. And after meeting with Dr. Nadler, they were split in two groups. One group would have lunch with our students and the second group would go on a tour and then they would flip halfway between. 
We did have to take a four week pause towards the end of December into early January when there was a second wave of COVID that occurred in 2022, 2021 to 2022. So uh, an overview of the, the cycle is over 12,000 applications, about 1,200 interviews invited for interviews, about 1,000 interviews. We accepted 676 applicants to fill a class of 214, which gave us a yield of 32%. Here's a brief synopsis of the demographics of the class over the last four years. As you can see, the numbers have basically remained the same. We have a slight uptake in New Yorkers at 59%. And for the first time, we have a dip in women to 49%. The number of underrepresented is 18%. And the number of New York medical grads, alumni, and faculty have basically remained the same. The 2022-2023 cycle opened on July 1st of this year, and so far we have approximately 10,000 applications. This will again be a virtual cycle, and we're hoping to follow the same format we did last year by inviting or accepted students to come in for virtual for a tour with, and, and meeting with our dean and students. Interviews for this new cycle start on September 15th. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ronnie Myers and I'm the Dean of the Toro College of Dental Medicine. And I'd like to speak today for a few minutes on the admissions process for the class of 2026. And we are the seventh entering class for the college, which started in 2016. Uh, and we were at that time, the 66th dental school in the country. Now there are 67 and since 2011, nine new schools have opened and there are seven new schools in the pipe, pipeline which obviously will increase the number of students matriculating to dental education uh, here we have a picture from our very first class in 2020 and our class of 2026 which arrived on campus on july 5th just to give you a broad spectrum of the national landscape uh, the applicant pool for dental education uh, which re reached a peak in 2007, has now slightly decreased over the course of the last uh, 13 or 15 years. Uh, and we're now at about uh, 10 and a half or 11,000 applicants uh, to dental school. And with the number of new schools opening, the number of matriculated students is greater. And so these are converging lines as far as the applicant pool to matriculated students is concerned. Uh, there are less applicants uh, for more spaces right now. The ratio is about 1.7 applicants to every space available. And as I believe in the next few years, as more schools open, uh, that will decrease probably to somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 1.4, let's say applicants to uh, matriculated spots. Uh, the gender uh, ratio has changed in dentistry just as it is in most uh, health professions, as you can see. Uh, back in 2000, uh, the ratio was somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 70% males to 30% females, and now it's actually reversed, and it's about 60% females to 40% males. And the historically underrepresented in dentistry uh, has also uh, changed uh, slightly in some areas, and not at all in others. Uh, the Hispanic Latino population has increased significantly. The Black or African-American population has increased, but only slightly. Uh, and the Native American and Hawaiian population has remained uh, flat, areas which need uh, direct intervention uh, across the country to help uh, improve the access to care issues. If we look closely at the new uh, TCDM applicant pool versus the admitted, we notice that the national applicant pool was about 10 and a half thousand. Uh, we admitted about 2,500. So one in four uh, applicants uh, to dental school is actually applying uh, to TCDM. Uh, and the average number of schools that an applicant applies to is about 10. Nationally, uh, the applicant pool last year was down about 6%, but TCDM continues on the upward slope of increasing the number of applicants who apply uh, to the college. 
If we look at our matriculated class, they come from 12 different states. We have eight international students, uh, four from uh, Canada, two from uh, South Korea, and two from China. Uh, the uh, ratio of men to women, as can seen here, is about 55% uh, female, 45% uh, male. Uh, and if we look at the underrepresented uh, class, uh, we do are now about 12%. We fluctuated last year um, uh, about the same. And if we look at the breakdown between Hispanic, Black, American Indian, uh, and Hawaiian, uh, we notice that there are uh, changes. Uh, and the biggest change is uh, certainly in the uh, Black African American for the class of uh, 2026. Uh, we matriculated our class on January 5th. Our DAT average, which is the national exam for entry into dental school, it was 21.4 out of 30, which was six for all privates and second in New York State. Our grade point average was 3.53 and our percent yield, meaning those that were accepted and those that actually accepted us uh, was 26%. And we have pictures here of our orientation and the happy young individuals who are now the class of 2026. And I thank you for your attention. Hello, I am Jerry Nava, the Dean of the School of Medicine, and I'm very excited to be part of this town hall. I wanna first acknowledge all of the efforts of the School of Medicine deans, the course leaders, the faculty, as well as staff in helping each class get off to a wonderful start this academic year. In particular, it's a very exciting time where we're rolling out a new curriculum, integrated curriculum in the School of Medicine. And there are many people to thank uh, for that effort, including Dr. Uh, Ludmer, as well as Dr. Kessler. It's really nice to be back in person too. And I'm sure all of our students and everyone's excited about that. Now, I was specifically asked to update you all on two major department searches that are currently underway in the School of Medicine. But I also want to mention it's a very exciting time as we are preparing our major self-study for the LCME site visit, which is going to occur in 2024. This is a major effort and in advance, I want to thank our deans, our faculty, staff, and also the students who are really participating in this uh, holistic effort. Now, the two searches. The surgery chair and service chief position at Westchester Medical Center is a major position. This search has been led, led by Dr. P Panzika, our, currently our chair of anesthesia. The search committee has done a wonderful job working with the search firm. We've identified a number of outstanding candidates and we are now looking at the candidates and bringing candidates on campus. Hopefully in the next coming months, we will have a decision uh, with a finalist for this very important position. So that search is going very well. The other search that we're just initiating is a search for the pediatric chair and also director of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital. This is a very important uh, search uh, given that Dr. Lenny Newman is retiring and Dr. Michael Gwitz is retiring. So it's gonna be a real challenge to identify the appropriate person to oversee these important roles. I'm very excited to say that Dr. Mo Chowdhury our chair of the urology department is heading up this search. The search committee has already been formed and the search firm is already engaged. The position description is about ready to be released and candidates are already starting to be interviewed. And we're hoping by next month, we'll have candidates presented to the search committee. So this search uh, is well underway and I'm very optimistic. We will also uh, uh, obtain wonderful candidates for this search as well. So I wanted to uh, thank everyone for all their efforts. It's an exciting time here at New York Medical College in the School of Medicine, and I'm very proud and excited to serve as your dean. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Salcedo, and I joined New York Medical College on August 1st as the designated institutional official to support and oversee the college's 22 sponsored residency and fellowship programs. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist who focuses on complex family planning and pediatric and adolescent gynecology. My academic interests are in health systems research and innovative models of residency training delivery. 
Most recently, I'm coming to you from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, where I was the residency program director for the standard training track in OBGYN, as well as its border and underserved leadership development track. I look forward to working with the New York Medical College community to continue advancing the cohesiveness of its GME programs and further the college's mission of excellence in scholarship and inclusion. Thank you. Hello, my name is Regina Williams. I am the Director of Human Resources for NYMC. I began my role August 1st of this year. I have been a human resources practitioner for nearly 30 years with the designation of Senior Certified Professional from the Society of Human Resources Management, which is the recognized professional membership association. Much of my experience has been in the public sector, specifically K through 12 education. I received my bachelor's degree from the University of Connecticut in stores, and I earned my master's degree also from the University of Connecticut School of Business in Hartford, Connecticut. Effective and sound human resources practices are built upon a platform of both technical and strategic approaches. One, to ensure that our human resources transactions are in full compliance with all mandated state and federal regulations. For example, this includes activities such as provided annual mandated trainings for our staff and complying with record retention requirements. And there are many, many more. The most effective and efficient means of meeting these requirements is by utilizing best practices. Second, I will be strategizing with the HR team we will develop departmental goals in support of the organization. In addition, I look forward to partnering with leadership as HR plays a critical role supporting our colleagues in all areas of the college as they strive to meet their individual and departmental goals. I look forward to working with organizational stakeholders in evaluating challenges and identifying opportunities for change. As a new member of the institution, one of my initial objectives is to expand my knowledge to better understand the college's operations. As an HR professional, I understand and embrace the importance of client services. HR has been and will continue to provide relevant and effective services to our faculty, staff, leaders, and other members of the community. As valued members of the organization, the HR team engages with the employee community on many different levels. We will strive to have a meaningful impact on our employees by assuring a positive experience for all. We will implement initiatives to support and refine our service delivery model. For example, HR will begin using a platform that will help organize workflows, allowing us to enhance our responses to employee inquiries. My hope and vision is that after employees interact with human resources, they're left with a positive impression and confidence that their needs have been met. I look forward to building upon the exemplary work that has been done. Should anybody be interested in visiting the department or want to engage in a conversation, please feel free to reach out to me directly or any other member of the HR team. I am thrilled to be a part of your community here at NYMC. Thank you.